in this modern era of hemp production in the United States, we're learning a lot about all phases of the crop. And the one section that I would like to help address are, are what's showing up in terms of insect issues. And a great many things have been found associated with hemp in the United States in the last few years. And some are important, some are not. Uh, but the most important one is an insect called the corn earworm, at least in our state, Colorado. The uh, corn earworm uh, has been the species that has caused the most damage. Uh, it has been spotty, uh, but it has caused extensive damage in some areas of the state. This is also an insect that can be found essentially across the United States. It is a highly dispersive insect, feeds on a wide range of crops. Historically, I've heard growers refer to this as a headworm or an army worm, uh, but the, the name that uh, is best associated with this would be the corn earworm. And you've probably seen this insect if you bought sweet corn and there's a caterpillar in the ear tip. Um, it does go by a couple other names uh, that have been formalized by the Entomological Society, which reflects how widespread this insect is on so many crops. So it might be referred to as the tomato fruit worm, were it to be in uh, a fruiting vegetable like peppers or tomatoes, and it's in cotton, it's called the bollworm. The corn earworm is a type of moth, the order Lepidoptera, so it will have complete metamorphosis. The moths will lay eggs on the host plant, the eggs will hatch, you'll have a larva, uh, which is the immature stage, we call it a caterpillar, if it's going to be a moth or butterfly. It's a little caterpillar, and then it grows and gets bigger and molts and grows and becomes a big caterpillar and does more damage depending on the size it has reached. When it's done, it'll pupate. Uh, that's, this is the transition stage uh, between the caterpillar and a moth. In the case of the corn earworm, they do it in the ground and they do not produce a cocoon around the uh, pupa. The adult of the corn earworm is kind of buff colored, uh, brown, not particularly distinctive. It is typical of moss in the cutworm, armyworm family. Uh, around here, if you know what the army cutworm, the miller moth looks like, it's, it's that kind of size, a typical cutworm family size. It is also an extremely migratory insect. It is capable of flights of many hundreds of miles. Um, so this is something that uh, can disperse into a new area uh, every year in a different manner. Winter is spent in the pupal stage, and the pupae occur in soil a couple of inches deep. And this is an insect that is not very well adapted to cold weather. Uh, so if the soil freezes to the area where the pupa is in the winter, it will be killed. Now, historically, uh, the northern limit of where corn earworm survives as a pupa through winter is somewhere around latitude 40. Uh, and here in Colorado, that would be the line just north of uh, Denver. Uh, kind of think of it as I-70, perhaps, is the, the limit where, where this one survives. North of it, it doesn't survive well. South of it, it does. But that, these are approximations. Uh, and uh, this insect does survive over winter uh, consistently in the southern part of the United States. It survives little if at all in the northern part and then there's of course there's an area in between where some may survive but this is a highly migratory species uh, they fly at night uh, at night when they're not flying they might sustain themselves with nectar from flowers which is very important for keeping them going and they will mate and females will be laying eggs uh, but these are highly migratory. So many of the infestations that are coming into uh, northern parts of the country originate from the south. And, and even in the southern areas, uh, they are redistributing. So, so this thing moves around a lot. Plants uh, become attractive to the egg laying by the females during specific growth stages. This has been best studied on corn. Corn is not attractive uh, before it produces tassels. When the tassels emerge and when you have green silks, uh, then it is attractive and eggs are laid on the plant. After the tassels brown, after the silks brown, this insect no longer lays eggs on, on sweet corn or field corn. In hemp, we don't really know uh, 
what is the most attractive stage yet, but it sure looks like it is when it's flowering. Um, we, we don't see eggs, we don't see damage before flowers start to appear. Uh, and probably when you have uh, nice, actively growing green flowers, uh, that would be when they're going to see peak egg laying, and not before that. Uh, the eggs may be laid near the flower buds, or in the case of the photo on the left, they were laid on a leaf near the, near the buds of the flower on hem. When the eggs hatch, uh, it will become a small caterpillar, and then it will feed, molt, and grow, uh, and then molt again, and molt again, and molt again. And typically, there are either five or six larval stages, and the small ones, of course, feed very little, and the big ones. Are what are doing all the damage. So the tiny ones, you know, first out of the egg, there may be only a millimeter and a half. When fully grown, they might be about 30 times that in terms of length and much greater in terms of body mass. So if we look at sweet corn, which is the system most often studied, after the eggs uh, hatch, the larvae feed on the silks, then follow them into the ear tip. So the eggs are laid on the, the silks and sweet corn, they feed on the silks and then they move into the ear and in sweet corn at that point you can no longer get them with any kind of insecticide. Uh, in corn in later stages uh, they stay within that ear tip, they stay within the, the uh, uh, plant on which they're feeding. Similarly they would do this on a tomato. And the caterpillars on any crop are going to be highly variable. This is this is an insect that is uh, maybe very pale colored. It may be green. It may be nearly black. It may have reds. This is all corn earworm. These are all caterpillars that came out of uh, one batch of sweet corn that I got a couple years ago. Similarly, in hemp, this insect is highly variable. Uh, you'll see a lot of different uh, range in terms of colors and patterns. So these are all corn earworm here taken out of hemp in Colorado. Now again the amount of damage that's going to be done is dependent on how big they are. Uh, so smaller younger stages may feed a bit on the leaves, nothing much, rarely do you notice that, and, and a bit on the flower parts. But since they're small they do, they do little feeding. Older larvae feed a lot more. They consume a lot more plant material and then they do uh, more uh, destruction in terms of how they're feeding. So it, they may tunnel into buds. They might may mine uh, the interior part of the bud, then come out and then maybe do another uh, one. Uh, a, a buds may be destroyed in a single larva. They kill multiple buds when they get big. Uh, and uh, the buds in evidence would be dead. They might be have evidence of being hollowed out a bit. Uh, you might also see the pellets, their, their frass, their excrement uh, associated with this. Uh, and in this, these pictures here, the frass is, is fairly dry. It, it may be moist, depending on the kind of environment around the buds uh, when they have been feeding. But this, these would be evidence of uh, corn earworm damage to these buds. This insect, by the way, is primarily a pest of hemp that is being grown for large buds. We're talking CBD hemp. Uh, it will be far less damaging to cultivars that are being grown for seed. There is one other insect I do want to point out um, that has an alternate diagnosis that damages buds. So these photos of, of hemp show dead buds. Uh, and it sort of looks like what I've been showing you that a corn earworm could do, but this is not corn earworm. There is a second caterpillar uh, that is capable of, of filling buds on hemp, and that's called the Eurasian hemp borer. And that will be a subject of a, of a different discussion. But the, the, the Eurasian hemp borer is a tiny moth that has a tiny caterpillar, and the caterpillars develop within the plant. They are not feeding on the bud from the outside of the plant. They're feeding... Uh, from within, they, they're st uh, stock tunnelers uh, during early generations, and it, when the buds appear, they are in the upper part, and they may ream the area underneath the bud. Uh, so in this case, the bud is killed because it's been tunneled underneath, not from the side, 
from the exterior. The Eurasian hemp borer uh, is normally a pale color as indicated in the picture on the right. In the last stage of a caterpillar, uh, it does turn this kind of pinkish color. But again, very tiny caterpillar found within the stem. You're not gonna see this out on the plant. Corn earworm, again, attacks it from a different way. It's coming in from the outside, uh, maybe chewing a, a, a little on the edge or maybe even boring into it a little bit and then going out and doing it again somewhere else. So a couple questions about management. One, one question might be, can crop rotation help with corn earworm? Uh, can I put my plant somewhere uh, uh, in, in between years and, and will this help? Um, well, crop rotation, moving a crop from one place to another does not work well with this insect. And that is because the corn earworm is a model for a highly mobile, highly dispersive species. I mean, in some parts of the, the country, it, it doesn't survive winter in your field from year to year. It's blowing up from uh, Kentucky or someplace. Um, and everywhere uh, it occurs, it is highly mobile. So no, this is not something where crop rotation would help. Uh, Crop rotation is useful for insects that are not very mobile between growing seasons. Furthermore, there are multiple generations uh, during a season. So if you have corn earworm in your area, it has had maybe one or two or three generations on other crops before they start moving into hemp late in the season. Can field location affect incidence of corn earworm problems? And this is a little bit different than the question of crop rotation. And I would say perhaps a bit um, and the issue here is that corn earworm is going to be somewhere uh, before it is in, in hemp. Uh, again, it has a couple of generations. And the adults are also attractive, attracted to flowers to sustain themselves. So, so one thing that might be a risk factor, and I'm not sure if it is, but it makes sense that it could be, is... A hemp field that is located near a corn field. Now, why would this be a risk? Because corn is highly attractive to a corn earworm in summer when it's got the tassels coming out and the uh, green silks. And then after that, they finish up in corn and then they're looking for something else uh, coming out in a late August or September, looking for something else. And what is that something else? It would be hemp. Hemp becomes attractive to corn earworm after most corn is no longer attractive and they have developed within it. And corn is the primary host, certainly not the only one that sustains this insect. So probably not a great idea to, to, to put a hemp field right next to uh, corn fields uh, because that would be a risk factor perhaps to increase damage from this insect. And then flowers. Uh, this is this is a, another issue. The, these moths sustain themselves on flowers and often it is a great idea to have flowering plants in and amongst crops because many of the natural enemies that, that attack different kinds of uh, pests in a crop, they feed on some nectar, they feed on some pollen. Uh, and so that's a desirable kind of thing to improve the diversity of the, the environment. I am not sure if it's a great idea if corn earworm is your problem because the adult moths will be looking for flowers to sustain themselves and then they will lay eggs. And if the flowers happen to be right next to a hemp field, then egg laying could increase in that nearby hemp field. Anyway, just a thought. And then are there biological controls effective for managing corn earworm and hemp? And, and the answer here, well, there's certainly plenty of predators that one can find in a, in a hemp field that would feed on corn earworm. Uh, many of the spiders, uh, particularly things like jumping spiders that prowl around on the crop or uh, various kinds of uh, plant, uh, excuse me, uh, prune bugs, uh, predatory bugs, assassin bugs, minute pirate bugs, damsel bugs that, that pierce uh, insect prey and suck their uh, blood out, as well as a couple of insects that are pretty common. Uh, here in Colorado, we've got this collops beetles. Uh, they'll feed on young caterpillars, get some green lacewing larvae. But the problem uh, is that they can be helpful, but they're not reliably effective. And, and part of the 
reason is because corn earworm is such a transient species. I mean, this isn't found in the crop throughout the whole season. It just comes in late. Uh, and so predators that would be associated with corn earworm aren't there necessarily because it takes a while for the natural enemies. Um, so hemp crops will normally not have sustained high enough levels of predators when corn earworm moves into the field. I wish it was different, but it's not. One thing I will say, though, is if you're going to have predators in your crop uh, it come September, it's because you had other insects earlier in the season that supported those predators. And the two common insects in a hemp crop that would sustain natural enemies uh, building up in the crop would be onion thrips and cannabis aphid. Cannabis aphid being the most common aphid in the crop, onion thrips being the most common thrips on the crop. Um, these are insects that normally are doing very little damage in the field, if any, prob probably none uh, for much of uh, the year. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more about cannabis aphid in another one of these. But uh, low levels are actually probably beneficial to the crop in that they provide food that would then sustain predators that could then feed on things that are more important, like corn earworm. Anyway, kind of a different way to think about uh, insects uh, that are feeding on the crop. Not all of them are necessarily uh, bad for production of that crop. It depends on what they're doing and how abundant they are. Now, information on this insect and other insects is available uh, through the hemp insect website that I will mention several times from now on. So for all the insects that we uh, have found in Colorado hemp, we have tried to develop a, uh, a sheet on this. And by we, I mean myself and, and Melissa Schreiner here, who is the co-creator and manager of the hemp insect website. Uh, now, how would you manage corn earworm in hemp? This is what I suggest is the best management approach we have for now. I mean, it will get better in the future, but uh, basically, what I think we can do is adapt what is used in organic sweet corn to co control corn earworm and, and use that for trying to control it in hemp. And this is going to involve monitoring. And then if we find a uh, population of, of moths at high levels during a critical time uh, when hemp is flowering, then we try to treat with them with uh, appropriate pesticides. And we'll get into details here. So this, this whole uh, plan that I'm talking about is a separate publication within the uh, uh, Hemp Insect website. So it, this explains everything I'm going to be talking about here. Uh, now, corn earworm is an insect that will vary from year to year. I mean, you could be hammered one year and get nothing the next year. That's just the way this thing works. Some areas, it's going to be a more chronic problem, uh, but some some places uh, you may see an issue one year and you know, five and other places it might be four years and five uh, but you can predict that you have potential for a problem if a large number of moths are flying out and about in your area when hemp is coming into flower so uh, this picture on the right happens to show a light trap sample from one night, September 8th in 2016, which was a bad year for corn earworm in southeast Colorado, the Arkansas Valley. Uh, it was not a bad year in northern Colorado, but in southeastern Colorado it was. Anyway, a lot of moths, and then we had a lot of damage uh, after that. So how would you figure out what the moths are doing. And, it, and what you use is a, is a trap that captures the moths. Uh, it specifically captures the male moths because we use what's called a pheromone to lure them in. And the pheromone uh, is a chemical that is produced, in this case, by the female of the species to attract a male. And we put a lure with a trap. And, and the kind of trap we use for uh, corn earworm is... Uh, kind of different than you might use for uh, other kinds of, of insects, uh, other kinds of moths. It's a pretty big trap, uh, and the insects fly in from the bottom and uh, will be funneled up to the top where you can see them. Uh, now, this is called a Heliothus-style trap. 
and it is required because this is a fairly strong flying moth in a simple sticky trap. It would often land and then could break break away from that. So you have a trap that has that has a lure at the base. The lure might look something like that in the upper left, and that has the sex attractant of the female of the corn earworm. You put the lure at the bottom, the moths are attracted to it, the male moths, they go into the trap and they're funneled up near the top. So again, uh, in these pictures here, the one on the upper right shows a little bit uh, kind of where they've all funneled up uh, in, into the top part. And that's where I would be looking to see how many I caught last night or over three day period or whatever. And pretty much the only insect that you will find in a pheromone trap is the insect that you have a lure to bring into it. Um, there may be a few other insects in there, but one of the nice things about a pheromone trap versus say a light trap is you get concentration of the species of interest to you, in this case, corn earworm. Otherwise you would get dozens of other kinds of moths and some of them look pretty similar. These also keep the moths in pretty good shape. Uh, in a light trap, they might get beat up by beetles and, and other moths beating them about uh, within the, the light trap. It breaks off the scales, makes them difficult to see. So what I would suggest for monitoring is you establish a program to monitor flights of the adult corn earworms using a pheromone trap. And this should begin by midsummer. The reason you want to do this by midsummer, even though the crop is not susceptible yet, is you've got to know what is the a number of moths that are around. I mean, what's a baseline? Because you want to know if things change, if things get high. So what is a high number? You don't know that unless you're monitoring regularly. Traps should be checked at least twice a week and you keep records of this. Uh, what you're looking for are changes in incidence coincident with when the crop starts to become susceptible. So uh, when you have a large number of moths flying, when hemp is starting to flower, that is a scenario for problems and that is where intervention may be appropriate. So again, the uh, crop is, is producing nice uh, uh, flower buds uh, and it's green and attractive and you're getting a lot of moths in your pheromone trap, not a light trap like here, although you could use that. Uh, that would be a situation that suggests you have potential for problems. And again, uh, all of this is uh, summarized in the sheets and the proposed plan. Uh, so if you have very high numbers of moths discovered during flowering, treatment should be considered. And there are two treatments that can be used here in Colorado. Uh, both of these are microbial products, meaning they are a, a microbe, a, a disease. One's a, 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 a producing organism, one's a bacterium, and, and the other is a virus that are selective for caterpillars, and particularly uh, the corn earworm uh, and related species for the viruses. Now, here we get into a, another issue that will be discussed in a separate one of these discussions. You can use things that are allowed in your state. The situation with what can be used on hemp at this point in time, and this is July 2020, is largely being regulated state by state because hemp has not been a legal crop. The federal direction for what is registered and registrations uh, for materials on hemp have not developed. Uh, so each state has come up with their own way of interpreting the law and regulating the law regarding what pesticides can be used on hemp. And it varies all over the place. Um, one of the things that will be in the Hemp Insect website is this uh, publication here. Uh, it's, it's an attempt to kind of summarize what is state by state, the regulations that are being used to enforce what kind of pesticides, including insecticides, can be used on hemp and what cannot. This, and, and some states allow a fairly broad range of products. Uh, uh, 
many of the Western states do. Some states do not allow anything that could be used on corn earworm. It depends on where you live. You have to check. Uh, I will have this uh, publication here posted in the regulations and pesticides section of the Hemp Insect website, but you will need to check your state. If you live in Montana, you live in Oklahoma, you live in Kansas, you probably don't have anything that would be allowed to be used in the state. You live in Colorado, you live in Oregon, you live in North Carolina, Virginia, you have some options. Uh, now, these are what are allowed just in Colorado. Again, it's state by state. We have two uh, products that contain the uh, microbacillus thuringiensis, the Azawi strain, and we have a virus that is allowed to be used uh, uh, that affects corn earworm. Uh, I, I mentioned bacillus thuringiensis. I mentioned the Azawi strain, and this is important. Perhaps you are aware of bacillus thuringiensis, Bt, uh, and there are lots of strains of this. Uh, and one strain is very widely used called the Kerstaki strain, and that's used on caterpillars. And corn earworm is a caterpillar. But corn earworm and other caterpillars in the cuntworm family tend not to be very uh, well controlled by the Kerstaki strain. You want the Azawi strain. And in Colorado, that would be a GRI, WG, or Zentari, uh, the DF formulation. Also, there's a BT in the Israelensis Israel strain. Perhaps you've used that for control of fungus gnats. Again, these are not, there are different BT products that have get different strains. You need the Azawi strain if you're going to have any chance of getting corn earworm. Uh, and then there are these viruses. Uh, there are uh, what are called nuclear polyhedrosis viruses, uh, and these cause disease. They cause the uh, caterpillar after it ingests it become infected and, and dies. Uh, uh, and uh, similar, similar to how a BT would be, would be used. It will depend on which state you live in, which one of these is going to be allowed. So presently, as of today, Helicovex is the only product that is allowed in Colorado. Uh, if you're in Kentucky, uh, they have done what are called 24C registrations, and they have two other products that are on the market and that are allowed in that state. It depends on your state. One final uh, question in terms of treatments, and this gets a little complicated, but do treatments need to be continued up to harvest? And, and the answer is no. Um, and it depends on uh, what kind of temperatures are going on uh, for when it would be safe to discontinue these treatments. Now, remember, the, the young stages, yes, they feed on the plant, but they don't feed much. I mean, what you the damage is going to be done by big caterpillars. So you don't want there to be big caterpillars in the crop uh, up to harvest. Uh, little caterpillars, eh, they're not going to do much. Um, so the question comes, how long after an egg is laid will it take for the large larvae to appear? And, and this, I'm, I'm going to blow through this quickly, but the basic idea here uh, is that Insect development is related to temperature. They are cold-blooded, uh, and the amount of warmth surrounding them will determine how fast they will uh, uh, develop. And this has been used extensively on a great many kinds of insects and crops uh, to predict the rate of development. So, so I'm not going to go into de details, but basically uh, what you have are degree day models that can be used to predict how how rapidly an insect will be developing based on temperature. Each insect has a base temperature below which it can't develop. In the case of a corn earworm, it's about 55 degrees Fahrenheit, meaning if, if it never gets above 55, they won't do any development. Uh, uh, and each day above uh, the base temperature, where there is temperatures above that, uh, they will develop at, at some increment, depending on how much temperature above the base occurs. So there are tables such as this. And uh, if you look up degree days and you look up the base temperature, this, you do this you know, on your own to, 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 to get this concept. Uh, but what it means, so if, if what we were to look at is just the development stages before, uh, after an egg is laid, 
And before you get to the big caterpillars, that would be how long does it take for an egg to hatch after it has been laid? And how long does it take for you to get the large caterpillars um, after the fourth stage? Uh, that would be a fairly large caterpillar. And uh, it would take in, uh, a number of degree days, a, a degree day being one degree of temperature, average temperature for a one day period. So if it was uh, 55 degree base temperature and it was 60 degrees, you'd have five degree days that day. Anyway, for the eggs to hatch, it requires 72.9 degree days. And small larvae uh, to get through that development until they're large larvae takes 147.1 degree days. Um, so if we then look at the average daily temperatures in Pueblo, Colorado during September, in September 1, the average daily temperature in Pueblo is 71.5 Fahrenheit, high of 86, low of 57. When you get to the end of the month, it's 61. It's 10 degrees Fahrenheit cooler, uh, and that will um, change the amount of degree days. Uh, if it's 71.5, uh, then you're getting 16.8 degree days every day. If it's 61 degrees, you're getting 6.3 degree days every day. And what that means is if we're looking at these average temperatures, uh, a an egg that was laid under temperature conditions in Pueblo of 71.5 degrees Fahrenheit average temperature would take 13.1 days on average for it to hatch and for the young stages to pass through until they were a fourth stage when they're starting to get damaged. Uh, come into the 11th of, of the month, it takes 16 days because it's a little cooler. If you're at the end of the month, it would take over a month for the egg to hatch and the uh, young stage to progress. So, so clearly, um, as things get cooler, you can back off. Uh, from, from treatments because they just won't reach that uh, final, uh, that those stages where they'll start doing real damage to the crop. And one last thing, there is another kind of insect closely related. It looks a lot like the corn earworm called the tobacco budworm. And in some places in the United States, tobacco budworm may be in a mixture with corn earworm, or it may be dominant. Uh, here in Colorado, all I'm finding is corn earworm. But uh, if you go to maybe New York or Florida, uh, as this picture in the lower left shows from uh, University of Florida, you might get a different related insect, the tobacco budworm. Very similar insect. And um, how would you modify a program if tobacco budworm was the key pest in your area? Only minor changes would be needed. But the big thing the only real thing would be the sex attractant, that, that little lure that you have. Uh, it would be a different sex attractant you would want to get if you were trying to monitor for the tobacco budworm than if you're trying to monitor for corn earworm. But essentially all other aspects of the management program, including the pesticides, would be the same. The same kind of BT products work on tobacco budworm and the same kinds of uh, virus insecticides work on it. Uh, one way you can distinguish these larvae that's out there on the web is a very nice video uh, done out at North Carolina State University. So if you can kind of keep this in mind, distinguishing tobacco budworms from corn earworms, uh, you can find that on the, on the web. And uh, it, it requires a close examination of the caterpillars. You need to look at some uh, kind of features that will require a little bit of magnification. But that's the way to do it. For more information on insects and hemp, check out the Colorado State Hemp Insect website if you have not done it already. It should come up. If you just do hemp insect website, it should come up. I don't think there's anyone else. So this would be what the first page would look like. Um, and there are various subsections within this uh, fact sheets, uh, hemp insect images, regulations and pesticide use, uh, one where we can post insect pictures. Uh, and this is one thing I would like to encourage you to do. If you have a photo of an insect on hemp that you'd like to have identified, send it to us. Uh, and uh, I could help you try to get it identified. And if it's okay with you, I would then like to put it in our Got Bugs section where uh, other images of insects on hemp are, are being posted. 
Uh, and if you have any comments, corrections, or suggestions, please send them to me. Um, and again, this is the first of a planned series of similar pre presentations. I, I'm hoping we will do perhaps a dozen or more of these on specific aspects of hemp entomology. Uh, and this is the prototype. And I am doing this July 14th, 2020. Uh, if I find that things need to change, I will redo this. Uh, and these will always be available through the Hemp Insect website. So uh, I hope you found some things of interest in this uh, at the Hemp Insect website. I will also have posted a PDF of this presentation so you could download that for your review as well. All right, have a, have a great year.